Hi, welcome to my uh, lecture on dexterous algorithm. I'm James Wen, and I'll start with a real life situation that happened to me last week. It's not an earth shattering thing or, or anything, but uh, it was Mother's Day uh, about a week ago, and I wanted to surprise my partner uh, with some fresh flowers in the morning. So before she woke up, and so I only had a few minutes to do that. And I wanted to go to one of the places in my neighborhood to get flowers. And I want to find the shortest place I can get to and back in about 10 minutes, right? So here's a diagram of uh, my options. Up here is uh, my home, I'm calling it uh, my humble abode. And you'll see shortly why I call it that. But um, close by there's a bakery and they have some generic flowers, but maybe not the best. There's uh, Chloe's flowers a little further away. Nearby there's dance plants. Um, some cacti and exotic things, maybe not the best mother to stay uh, flowers, and a place called Emma's Garden. Um, so that's uh, a place with good reputation. I like to go there, but it depends on how far away it is, how long it takes to get there and back. All right, so there are roads uh, between all these places, some direct to my house and some indirect. Um, and I know uh, the amount of time it takes to get from uh, one place to the next. Uh, and there's a time associated with that for that road. So there's three minutes to get from my home to the bakery. So six minutes there and back. Emma's Garden, it takes seven minutes. So 14 minutes there and back, a little longer. But there's a road connecting the two places, the bakery, Emma's Garden, takes only a minute. So maybe a good option for me to actually go indirectly to Emma's Garden. It's a short amount of time because the road to Emma's Garden actually has a big mountain and it takes a lot of time to get through. Now, the important thing is that all the roads have some kind of cost function in terms of the amount of time it takes for me to traverse that road. And now help me calculate how much time it takes me to get to all these places. I, I want to find the shortest uh, time it takes. Now, this is a fairly simple graph, right? So not many things, you can eyeball it and pretty much figure it out. But if the graph gets you know, more complicated, um, then it takes a bit more time and can use a bit of help. So let me close the video so I get out of the way. Okay, so the question I have is, what are the shortest paths from my home to all the places, in this case, that uh, has flowers? So this is a great question for Dijkstra's algorithm. Okay, so uh, let's see what it is. Given a graph, so the graph would be that uh, little uh, map I just showed you with weighted edges, so that would be the distances, uh, the amount of time it takes between those nodes in this case, and a starting vertex, that'll be my home. Dijkstra's algorithm finds the shortest paths to all the vertices from the starting vertex, okay? So, a couple of comments about the algorithm. It's what we call a greedy algorithm. So that means it considers only the short-term gains. So at any given point, it looks at the best option it has and it goes with it. That's not a very, forward thinking thing, but it does that in hopes of finding the optimal solution at the end of the, uh, the whole routine. All right, and it does this by building the shortest path using the shortest subpaths because the shortest path is made up of shortest subpaths. Now this statement sounds maybe a little bit obvious or maybe profound, <laughs> not really sure which one it is, but uh, let me give you a bit of a illustration to give you some intuition for this. So let's say you have a vertex A, that's the starting vertex, and B, and this is a path between the two that's right now considered to be the best, the shortest path. Let's say five minutes to get from uh, B to A. So what happens is, if this is considered a potential shortest subpath, B will go to its neighbors and say, hey, you wanna use my subpath to make your path the shortest one there is? So it goes to neighbor C first, and neighbor C goes, well, let's see, it takes me eight minutes to get to A. It takes you only five minutes. Yeah, maybe that'll be a better thing, but first I have to get to you before I use your subpath. So what's the weight on this one? Uh, four minutes, so it'll take me a total of nine minutes to get to A if I go through you. So it's not a shorter path. So I'll stick with my eight minutes. Okay, so B goes great. Let me ask my other neighbor, D, would you like to use my shortest subpath of five to get to A as part of your path? And D goes, well, it takes me seven minutes to get to A. 
So this might be a good thing to do if I can get to you fairly quickly. So how much time does it get? Take for me to get from B to D, takes one minute. So you add it up, that's six minutes for me to get to A through B, which is better than seven minutes. So yes, thank you. I'll take your sub path and make it part of my right now shortest path. So that's roughly the idea behind Dijkstra's algorithm. And I'll go into greater detail now to run through the algorithm. And so here's the map that I had earlier with all the florist and the home. Um, we need a graph for Dijkstra's algorithm, that's this. We need the weighted edges that uh, would be here with the numbers. And we need a starting vertex, which is my home here. Okay, so just to make it easier to read, I'm going to abbreviate all these places with the first letters, which is why I used abode for home uh, originally. Okay, so we'll put that graph down here. Here's a pseudocode of Dijkstra's algorithm. And here's a table to help us keep track of all the variables we'll be using along the way. So for each vertex, we're going to keep track of the shortest distance from it to the starting vertex. And the node or the vertex that it came from, which is one it will go to if it's going to use a subpath, that's all free. Okay, so uh, let's jump into it. First, we initialize each vertex with the distance from the starting vertex. All right, and so by definition, starting vertex to itself, the distance is zero, you're, you're already there. And we're going to set every other vertex to be infinitely far away from it, just to kind of help us um, with the bookkeeping. You'll see how that kicks in shortly. All right, so with that initialization done, we go into the routine itself. First thing we do is we jump into a while loop and it says, if there exists any unvisited vertex, and right now they're all unvisited, then we find the unvisited vertex, we call it V, with the shortest distance. Well, by definition, from our initialization, that's A, distance of zero. Everybody else is really far away at infinity. So that's our vertex V. And so with that vertex, we go to all of its unvisited neighbors, call those N, and for A, that would be B and E, and we iterate through those. So we'll start with B, neighbor B, and we define something called new distance. And that's a distance to V. So right now it's A to A to itself, that's zero. And we add that to the distance from V to N, that's three. So this is the subpath to itself and the cost to get to that subpath, which is three. We add those together and we compare. If the new distance is shorter than the distance that exists for the neighbor, right now it's infinity, then we replace it with the thing we just calculated. So three is less than infinity, we replace it with three, and it just came from node A. So that's our path that we'll be taking. Okay, so we're done with that. We go to the next neighbor, that's E. We do the same thing. We let new distance be defined as the distance to the starting node, starting vertex, plus distance between uh, the vertex and its neighbor, seven. And if the sum is less than the current value, which is infinity, then we replace the current value with seven and give it a from vertex over here. Okay, now we'll go back, run it again. It's uh, out of vertices, so we mark A as visited with these gray boxes, and we go back to the top of the while loop. Okay, so using the greedy algorithm, we want to find the unvisited vertex with the shortest distance now. And these are the unvisited vertices, three, infinity, infinity, seven. So B is the closest one with the distance of three. So that's our next vertex that we look at and we iterate through its neighbors that are unvisited. So that'll be C and E. All right, so we do the same routine. We go to C, we define a new distance to be the distance uh, from B to A, that's a subpath, that's the shortest subpath that exists now. And we see, what it is when we add it to the distance from C to B, and it's better than what C has now, which is infinity, so of course it's better, we replace that with now the shortest path, which is a uh, distance of five, and it comes from vertex B. We do the same thing with vertex E, which right now has a distance of seven. So we look at the distance from B to the starting vertex, which is three again. We add the cost of E going to B, and then going from B to the starting vertex. So that's three plus one, that's four. That's better than seven. So we replace the seven 
with a four, and now we change the from prefix from A to B. Okay, so we go to the next one. There is no next one. Boom, we go back to the start, uh, start of the while loop. Okay, so now the vertex greedily with the shortest distance is E. So we go with that one, look at its neighbors. It has two that are unvisited, C and D. And so it starts with C, goes through the same routine, right? So the distance from E to the starting vertex is four and offers that as the shortest subpath that exists. And the C's, whether it's worthwhile for C to go to E, but across two to use that subpath across the four, which is six altogether, if that's better than what it has now, which is five, and it's not. So it doesn't do anything, skips the replacement, and now it jumps to the next neighbor, D. Goes through the same routine. From E to A is four, from D to E is six, so it costs 10 to go from D to A through E, and that's way better than infinity, so we replace that with 10, and the front vertex is E. Okay, so E's done now. Mark it as visited, and now we go again to look for the shortest uh, distance in our remaining unvisited vertices. That will be C. And C has one neighbor, D, go through the exact same routine. We see whether the distance from C to A, which is five, and the distance from D to C to use that subpath, which is four, the sum of that is better than what the current uh, distance for uh, D is right now, which is 10. So nine is shorter than 10. So we replace 10 with the nine and we change the vertex to C. All right, so that's done. We go to the last vertex D. It doesn't have any unvisited neighbors. So that's done. And this routine is over. All right, great. So let's take a look at what this table tells us about the shortest paths and how we can reconstruct these uh, Short, shortest paths in our graph. So let's say we want to go from, you know, home, vertex A, um, to some vertex D, in this case, uh, dance plants, I think. And uh, we use this table by starting with vertex D, the destination. We write that down. Here's where we're going to have our path, ultimately. And we look across this row and see where it came from. It came from C. So we put C as uh, uh, prepended to this path. And we follow C to its row, it came from B, pre-pin B to this path, same thing, B's row, it came from A, pre-pin that, A, that's the starting vertex, so it came from nowhere, so that's the end of this routine, and we have our path A, B, C, D, that's the shortest path, A to D, all right, so that's three, two, four, that's nine. The, what looks like a shorter path, A through E to D, is actually 13, so this is the shortest path based upon the width. So that's Dijkstra's algorithm. Now let's take a look at uh, the complexity uh, analysis of this algorithm, how much time it'll take. Now here's the pseudocode again. The initialization part is order n. We go to each vertex and we initialize it with the distance, either zero or infinity at the beginning, right? So that's n visits. And the main loop, we go to each unvisited vertex. So that's also order n. But inside the main loop, there's a nested loop, a for loop, where for each vertex, we go to each of its unvisited neighbor. So that's potentially an order n uh, loop, right? So we put that there and let's continue on. There's another uh, order n operation here, and that's implicit within the find. You're looking for the vertex with the shortest distance, so you may go through all the vertices. So order n just to find one with the shortest distance. So you put all these together, you get basically an order n square uh, analysis for this, which is, of course, not the best performance that you want. But let's look more closely at this part because uh, we're looking at potentially what could be the worst case, but this is not necessarily the case. So let's start again with a for loop. Okay, so the idea here is you're visiting each of the unvisited neighbor of a vertex. So typically, if you think of it, um, you can create an adjacency matrix for order vertices so that if a neighbor exists, let's say row V column W, if the neighbor VW exists, then the matrix entry VW is one. And if the neighbor, 
neighbor does not exist, then it's zero. So you go through each of the element of that row for that vertex to figure out whether you have neighbor or not. So that's pretty costly. So that's order n squared. But if you think about it, you don't need to go to the ones that don't exist because they don't exist. So that's kind of wasted effort. Another approach is to use an adjacency list where you're just storing the neighbors that exist. And so for each neighbor you visit, that's an edge that is actually in the, the graph. So that's actually order n, that's order number of edges. And so even though it's a nested loop, you're not wasting time looking at things that don't exist. You just go to the edges that exist already, and that's order n. So this is deceptive if you just jump in and say, oh, nested loops, order n squared. And now let's look at this. This is going through a search of essentially a list of vertices. And so when you do a search, you go through each one for the minimum, and that's order n. You look at all the elements, you pick up the minimum one, and that's uh, done n times, so that's also n squared. But if you recall this uh, structure called the heap, well, that's order n, uh, the heap is a structure that allows you to get the minimum element in constant time, right? It's always at the root of the heap. It's this particular case, this is a uh, minimum priority Q. And so the structure of heap is such that you can extract that root in constant time, but if you want to remove it from the heap altogether, that's log n time. It has to readjust this tree. It's a bounce tree, so it's log n depth. And it readjusts itself so that the new minimum is floated to the top as a root. And so you have two operations to peek at the, uh, the minimal element is constant time and to delete it from the heap and to readjust it, it's gonna cost log n. You do that log n uh, n times, that's n log n. So the performance for this is potentially n log n. The one extra thing you have to do is add in some initialization code because we have to recreate initially the, uh, the heaps or the minimum priority queues for each of the vertices. And that creation is also log n for all the insertions. And so it's n log n performance there uh, to insert all the edges into their uh, heaps. And these other parts we know what we've seen already, it's, log, it's uh, n, or n for initializing uh, distances. And this we just saw is n log n. And this is uh, the for loop is actually log n altogether, even though it's nested, it's just going through the edges once. And so the performance for the entire routine is actually n log n, which is pretty decent. Okay, so with that, let's jump into the potential applications. Uh, there's a lot of different applications for the XRS algorithm. I'm going to give you three examples to illustrate the potential of this uh, cool little routine. First one is uh, network routing on the internet. So as you may know, the internet was invented uh, 30, 40 years ago to, uh, the, to address the worries that uh, there might be a nuclear strike uh, during the Cold War. And so communications would go through potentially um, communication hubs, right? These are centralized places where all the data flows through, but those are high value places and they make it destroyed by uh, an ICBM a nuclear missile. So the idea was to decentralize these hubs. So every source has multiple paths to get to its destination. Right? So if one of these um, communication centers uh, were destroyed, then it'll just find another path to get there. So the idea behind this is that um, if you have all these different paths you can choose from, you want to get the shortest path um, every time, just for efficiency's sake. And that's where the ISRS algorithm makes a lot of sense. You find the shortest path between some node and all the other possible nodes. Okay, another example is uh, friend suggestions on social networks. So you have all these emails suggesting that you become uh, connected with somebody because of some crazy interest you, you share. And it does this by finding the shortest distance uh, along a metric that it thinks might be uh, worthwhile. So your interest in nature, traveling, you know, books, what have you, the shortest distance you have with someone else with those interests, they'll send you an email saying, hey, why don't you connect with this guy? And so that's using Dijkstra's algorithm as well. And finally, uh, the example I started with, finding florists using navigation tools. So 
you're driving to a place, use the Stikes algorithm to find the shortest path there. Um, but these days, of course, it's a lot more sophisticated because you may be worried about traffic conditions, which is essentially the cost function that may change uh, dynamically. So things have to be updated. So it's a lot more complicated now. You may be interested in other metrics like fuel consumption and other things. But at the core of this uh, would be Dijkstra's algorithm. All right, so that's the end of my uh, lecture on Dijkstra algorithm. Thanks for watching. See ya.